Well, good morning and welcome to our live broadcast. Here today in historic Cambridge, England, right next to, outside of, in fact, the Church of St. Edward, King and Martyr. Uh, as you will see from the notice board that is in front uh, right here, that this is a parish church that has stood here for over a thousand years. And St. Edward's was the cradle of the English Reformation. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about that. I'm just going to come into shot interview uh, with you here this morning and uh, then we'll uh, have a little bit of a chat. I hope it's all coming through OK to you. Things seem to be working OK today. So let me come and say hi. So, yes. So here you have the uh, interesting bit of information at the top here. Um, in fact, inside this church, if you go in there, the same pulpit that Ridley uh, uh, Latimer preached uh, from is still there now to this day. So the heart of the English Reformation, uh, which was here in Cambridge, various different people, but one of them was Latimer, and he preached in that church, um, and the pulpit is still there. You can put your hands on touch it today. It's all those years ago um, that Latimer was in there. And Latimer was actually martyred here in England. Ridley and Latimer were burnt in the street, actually, and um, famously crying out, um, you know, they're lighting a fire today that will sort of burn in England forever or something like that. And I think it was, it was either Latimer or Ridley, I can't remember which one now, that cried out as they were being martyred, as they burned, God, open the eyes of the King of England. Uh, incredible story. You can look that up, Ridley and Latimer, martyrs. Look it up on Google and find more about it. Perhaps I'll do a bit more in-depth study on it myself so I can present it to you a little bit better than what I'm doing today. I don't know all the details, um, but just to say, so in this church anyway, uh, it, they were preaching yeah, at the start of the Reformation in England. Now, this church is also very different. Normally, uh, churches in an in a parish, I believe, are under the authority of the bishop of that diocese or area, something like that. This church is different because it's not under the authority. And it would, I think it would have been the Bishop of Ely at the time. It's not under the authority of the bishop. It's under the authority of the crown directly. Um, so it, it, it was very, very different. And they, so they could preach and not be told you're not allowed to preach that in these churches. Because if the bishop didn't like what you were preaching, you could be ordered to stop preaching in any church that was under the authority of the bishop. However, this church, there's a special name for this, and I can't, I, I can't remember it. I have been told it, but uh, I'll get all those details for you somewhere. But this church is under the authority of the crown, you know, the monarchy in England directly, rather than, under a bishop locally. So they were able to preach this message of reformation without being stopped from preaching it. I mean, eventually they were martyred, um, numbers of people, but I think it was Ridley, Latimer, um, I think another famous person was uh, Erasmus, I believe. Is it Erasmus and Cranmer? Not quite sure of all the details. I'll have to get some more, get better studied on that one, so I'm not say tell you the wrong things. But you can look up on Google the English Reformation. And, uh, so I'm literally outside the church where this was preached in, right here in the heart of Cambridge. So let me um, take you round and I'll show you the church here uh, and you can you can see uh, what I'm talking about. So here we go. We have a little bit of a walk on the tripod. You're on a tripod at the moment. So so here is the door. This is the entrance way in. Very nice too. Lovely gardens here. Um, we can go around this way a little bit. Might just leave my tripod here for a second um, and take the phone off because it's a bit difficult to manoeuvre. So. Uh, 
This is like a graveyard here. And this is the church. Getting to see here from the English Reformation. Tripod. <laughs> Nobody wants to walk after that. <laughs> At some point, I will um, look to get some filming from inside the church. I do know people from within here, actually. And it was, um, I was actually at a joint leaders meeting here recently and God's spirit was quite powerful and I gave a prophetic word at that meeting um, so that was very very interesting so so that just gives you a little bit of a view of the of the church it's literally right in the center there's an old bookshop there down some historical alleyway this has been a long long time um in fact it's predates the universities at Cambridge. Because if it's been in a thousand years, that would be in 1000 and something, wouldn't it? You know, 1021 or something, you know, if it, that's whatever. And the universities didn't start here until 1269, I believe. So this church actually predates every single university building in Cambridge. So there we are. You can see, that's the Guild Hall. You can see it right at the end of that passageway where the mayor is, and all that in Cambridge. Uh, just going past uh, a shop here. And it's uh, Owen Howell's shop here, Campkin's Cameras, famous photography shop. And I you know Owen, he's got a lovely little dog called Nedley. You Glass bottle on the floor there, let's see. Look at that. Rolling around, wide bottle. There's Owen's shop. And uh, then he got run over by a street sweeper on the pavement, would you believe? Look at that. <laughs> on the pavement. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this is Owen's shop anyway, very cynical camera. Captain's camera, a little plug for Owen there. Um, so we've come out of the alleyway there, and we're right in front of the historic King's College Chapel, the largest Gothic chapel in the world, and you can see the alleyway goes back down there, you can just about see the notice board, you can just about see the notice board there of the, um, of St Edward's there, it's down that alleyway right down at the bottom there, so there we go. Of course, the world is beginning to wake up here, early Sunday morning. And uh, would you believe I've got to move again for the road sweeper that's coming on the pavement again, clean it up. So there you go, King's College Chapel. And of course, you can see the uh, very fancy entrance right there. We'll wait for our road sweeper man to get Doing a good job cleaning up the city for us. Um, so this is King's College. This is this road here in the middle. It's a pedestrianised area. This is King's uh, King Street, King Street, whatever. King's Par King's Parade. That's the King's Parade. I get it right. Great St Mary's Church there. Um, that's where all the university civic functions take place. I did actually um, take part of, in a service there once. A friend of mine was got married and I prayed uh, in there. I loosed a powerful prayer right there, right next to the Senate building. That's there, the Senate building. and goes around there behind that tree. That's where they conf confer degrees. Hang on, I'll just get this back on the tripod. That's where they confer degrees upon people in Cambridge University. So Great St Mary's Church is the church that there that they will use there. And then over there is the Senate building, all around there. And then if we go around this way, and there, obviously, is King's College Chapel, which, as I say, is the largest Gothic chapel in the entire world. It's absolutely massive, and um, there's quite a lot of interesting history behind that place. I mean, Oliver Cromwell, when he came to Cambridge, he stayed with his horses in there. 
to show them who's boss, basically, and all that kind of stuff. So that's a bit of an interesting history there with that uh, building. And, of course, it's not just a church-type building. I can't believe how much racket going on here today. It's unbelievable. Two minutes ago, it was absolutely silent around here. But we've got to get cleaned up, and these guys are doing a great job. So, anyway, um, so... I'll just wait a second till all this noise dies down because you're not going to hear me anyway. <laughs> so, as I say, there's the entranceway to go into King's College. Uh, there are those big doors that you can see. Get my finger, there you go. See those big doors there? That's uh, the w way yeah. in. Again. So, um... More historic buildings. This universities go down that way. There's others the other way, and this is only a very, very tiny view of all that is uh, the, the university uh, town of Cambridge. And usually, I think it's true in England. If you are, um, if you're called a city. Usually, you've had a cathedral uh, with a bishop in it. So, the, a cathedral had a, had, as the seat of the bishop. Um, whereas, I don't believe Cambridge has got a cathedral, as far as I know, but it is called Cambridge City Council. I think, you know, it's a city state. The city status can be conferred in different ways, I believe. I, I don't know all the ins and outs of that. You'd have to Google that one. But. So, so, there we are. King's College is there. Uh, down the end there, I'll, I'll go back behind the camera. Uh, down the end there, the end there. That's Gonville and Keys University, and then down, you keep going down that street there, which there is Trinity Street. It goes from Kings Parade to Trinity Street, and there's various universities down there. Trinity College is just over behind that way, actually over behind. You can't see it from here. So it is an, an amazing place, Cambridge. I actually love Cambridge. It's an it's Awesome, awesome, uh, historic place. And as I say, the church that you were, you were at there that um, the Reformation was in, and they used to meet around here and have meetings uh, not far from here as well. So let's go for a little walk down this way a bit further, and then we'll perhaps have a little chat about some other things in the prayer. But I'm just going to take you further down the street here while it's quiet. Uh, in a few hours' time, this place will be so packed, you'd hardly be able to walk down the road. Because Cambridge, at least a few years ago, used to be the third most visited city in the whole of England. Because of the, all of the colleges, there are 29 colleges that come under the umbrella of Cambridge University itself. And so under the university, there are 29 colleges, I believe. So it, 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 there's a whole lot to it. There's so much you could say about Cambridge. It's so historic. Um, you see somebody up there, look. You see him at the statue. Now, coming up just up here, um, would you believe that this crazy-looking clock here cost a million quid, a million pounds? What a waste of money. But anyway... Uh, so this very unusual looking clock, it's got like a creature at the top, like a locust or something, but it's a weird looking thing anyway. And the time is told by those blue dashes there to tell you what the time is. So and the seconds go round. Somebody spray painted the glass recently in a protest. This was actually opened by Stephen Hawking. Um, it, it, on this thing, you can see it here, look. Inaugurated by Stephen Hawking, because he lived just up the road from here, actually, Stephen Hawking. It's called the Corpus Clock, as you can see. As we go down the, this street, street, uh, Bennett Street, or Bennett Street, Bennett Street, we come to a very famous place here, 
for the Eagle Pub. This is the Eagle Pub. Now, the Eagle Pub itself, amazing things have taken place in the Eagle Pub. So, I'm going to... Uh, you can see there's some, a notice board there that gives some information. What was really interesting about the Eagle Pub was this. I mean, <laughs> take, for example, um, around Cambridge, there are these blue plaques on the wall, right? So if you can see this, if I zoom you in, it says DNA double helix, 1953, the secret of life. And for decades, the Eagle was the local pub for scientists from the nearby Cavendish Laboratory. And it was here in February the 28th, 1953, that Francis Crick and James Watson first announced their discovery of how DNA carries genetic information. So there you go. So they would sit in this pub here, having a pint of beer or whatever, inside this pub, and talking about the fact they've just discovered DNA. Um, and it's all very close together. So there's the old doors that go into the Eagle Pub. So it would have been, I would imagine, what they call a coaching inn, where stage coaches would then bring people to Cambridge from wherever, and maybe they would drive through these gates with the horse and carriage. People would then go and stay at the inn for the night, it's, you know, like, like a hotel, really, you know, that type of thing, on, off of the stagecoach. And they can shut those big doors behind them. Now, this little little lane here, it's called Free School Lane. You can see it up there, there's the sign for it there, Free School Lane. Very old-looking buildings and things. Another church here on our right. But remember, these guys are discovering DNA and then going down the pub down the road there and having a chat about it. Well, this is the site of the former um, Cavendish Laboratory that was mentioned on the sign there at the Eagle Pub. So if we go down here, now we've only walked a very short distance, as you can see, from the Eagle Pub. more historic buildings here and then we come outside of now this is the site of the former cavendish laboratory they've moved it now a newer facility or, or some of it so you can see here let me just put my tripod steady one second right oh so what it says, it says Cavendish Laboratory, 1874 to 1974, it's 100 years, established by the Duke of Devonshire and extended by Lord Raleigh in 1908 and Lord Austin in 1940. The Cavendish Laboratory housed the Department of Physics from the time of the first Cavendish professor. So this is all to do with Cambridge University professors. James Clark Maxwell until its move to new laboratories in West Cambridge. Okay. So this building here, this building here, inside there, going through these great, again, this is what you'll see everywhere in Cambridge, these huge wooden oak doors. Look at that. Rather ornate, very expensive. And there's a some kind of Latin motto, I think it is. I can't read that. I don't read Latin. And within the big doors, they sometimes have a little door inside it, like you get through, or they can open both sides of the door. Now, if we go down here, I think there's another informational plaque on the wall, which will tell you what went on in this building here. So remember, we've gone from the local pub the Eagle, where the scientists would go and have, have lunch and have a pint of beer or spend the evening, you know. Now, here we go. <laughs> Let's read this. In 1897, uh, at the old Cavendish Laboratory, J.J. Thompson discovered the electron. So the electron was discovered right where I'm standing and subsequently recognised as the first fundamental particle of physics 
and the basis of chemical bonding, electronics and computing. So all of that was discovered right here where I'm standing. The basis of computing was established. You know, imagine the enormity of that there. I think if we go further down, there's one more plaque, which I think is very, very interesting, of monumental significance. I mean, you can't overstate the next one. I mean, the basis of computing and DNA in this road, both of them, okay, now, I'm not sure if it says it here or not, so I'm going to have a look. But there was a plaque here that said another thing. I'll see if I can find it. Uh, I've got that. Talking about somebody called um, John Hopkins. But there, ah, there it is. I knew there was another plaque. Nearly there. So finally, here we are today. I'll put this down. So, we're outside the laboratory of physical chemistry. So, can you see that? Laboratory of physical chemistry. And again, you can see this is the uh, University of Cambridge and the Department of History and Philosophy and Science also. And the Whipple Museum of Science. Okay. Oh. Always somebody around here getting in the way. And uh, so, yeah, no, it's not. That's not the plaque I'm looking for. Actually. Um. <laughs> see, nobody's supposed to park or come around here. Just double yellow lines, really. I don't think so. Anyway, so finally, I can't see the plaque I'm looking for, so never mind. Anyway, the other thing about it as well, as far as I know, was here, I think it was in 1932, that the, um, I believe that they split the atom as well in, here in this place as well. So, all of those things took place here, down this road. DNA discovered, electron discovered, the basis of computing, everything else, the atom being split, all in this bit here. All down this road. I mean, talk about big things, DNA, atomic stuff, and computing, all in the one, well, it was a big, massive place, and you can't see most of it, because it's behind the great facade, and you don't get to see everything. I hope you've enjoyed that, despite all of our interruptions this morning. So that's Cambridge, England. This is the Cavendish laboratory. You can see how big it is, because I was walking past it, and I'm still going. <laughs> so there you go. Take you back round towards King's Parade and go from there. Let me just stop for a moment. Put this on the tripod. It's difficult doing all this. But people are filming normally, they've got whole teams of people, cameramen, and, and all, all, all kinds of stuff. So you know, I'm doing it all on my own here. So uh, you can uh, get a few bits like that. Uh, turn the camera around. If I can get this right. There. Okay, so we're back round again. So, um, I think it's interesting stuff, all of this. I say this is the Cavendish Laboratory behind me right now. The atom split in there. DNA discovered in this building. Um, the electron discovered in there. <laughs> Now, they've moved to a new site now, the laboratory, and to West Cambridge, up near to uh, a place called Eddington, I think. There's a new Sainsbury's up there and a new uh, housing area. So, there you get, get a little shot of the street there for you.
It's absolutely amazing to think that in this one street, this one area, this one laboratory, that all of these major discoveries were made. You can see on my, that's it, it's, it's round back to front, this camera, it's hard to do this. You see these blue plaques on the wall, they're informational plaques, so that when people come and they come to Cambridge, they can uh, find out all of the uh, interesting information um, about the city just by reading some of these plaques. So look out for those. If you come to Cambridge, look out for the blue plaques on the walls of the historic buildings, because that will then give you lots of really good information and history about the city of Cambridge. I'm actually quite passionate about history, and I like to find that stuff interesting. And um, and I know people appreciate that when I do this type of thing and show them around a place. Um, so, you know, I thought I'd give you that opportunity today, and I like doing it anyway. So uh, I'm going to have to turn around a bit here to get this working so I can walk and talk, because I've got, I've got a large tripod here, and I've got to adjust things so I can talk to you and walk along without it dragging on the floor. <laughs> it's all very technical. So not. <laughs> if it was, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, so let's go for it back to near King's College. We'll have a chat and I can drink some of my coffee. The secret is about myself. I've got coffee, believe it or not, as well. So um, here we go. Going through some bollards there, nearly there. See, it's all very, very close together, this. I mean, you've, you've, um, <laughs> you've seen the Cavendish Laboratory. I've just been there. How big it is, how long and extensive the facilities are. Most of it's behind the facade that you can't get to see anyway. And then we get round the corner here. And there's the Eagle Pub again, so it's really close together. There's the pub again as we go past. Uh, St. Benet's Church here behind me again. Look, there's another church there. Uh, Cambridge has got lots of churches there. Another historic church. You know, you could do a broadcast and go around just talking about the churches of Cambridge and their history and what went on and who's attended that was famous and or done something notable in society and history. There's many, many things like that. And now we're already back onto the King's Parade. And in front of us is King's College Chapel. Let's set the tripod down. Level you up a bit. So there's the clock I mentioned. It's all back. When you move, it goes the opposite way. It's really awkward on this camera. So <laughs> it's, it's counterintuitive. That clock there, that weird clock, that gold looking clock, cost one million pounds. Was opened by Stephen Hawking, who lived not very far away from me. I know where he lived. Um, because I know someone that's been in his house. Just to say as well, I mean, um, the, um, no, no, but I won't tell you that information here now. Let's go over towards King's anyway. And let's have a chat. You're allowed on the grass and everything here and people picnic in front of the chapel. So that's quite a nice thing to do. Get a nice day and there's literally dozens and dozens of people all on the grass in front of King's College Chapel. And later on, I mean, yesterday was pretty heaving through here, I can tell you. Um, really busy. I was in the Market Square yesterday, doing some evangelism, and um, I prayed for a man who had arthritis, got a word of knowledge for him that he had arthritis, which he was very amazed about. Because he said, how do you know that? <laughs> I said, well, God showed me. I prayed for him for his arthritis in both shoulders. He was instantaneously healed. Um, that's just around the corner from here. So, literally, 100 yards around the corner is where that happened yesterday. Let's go over the wall. Just jumping over that wall. <laughs> With all this stuff. It's going to stand in front of King's College Chapel, built by Henry VIII, the English king. 
uh, if I go a bit forward, you'll see it behind me, I guess. So, yes, come on, our tripod. And there behind me, you can see the glory that is King's College Chapel. Ooh, you're quite heavy, this tripod. After a while of carrying it, your arms ache. You don't do it right. I can carry it a different way. It doesn't make your arm ache, but then you can't see me on the camera or, you know, that sort of thing. So, so, so there we go. King's College Chapel right there. English Civil War, Oliver Cromwell rode into Cambridge, smashed all the stained glass windows of all the churches in Cambridge. But those windows you see behind me, they're stained glass, but they were left untouched. The theory behind that is that money's changed hands and they were asked him, please don't break these windows, and he didn't. Um, don't know, but that's what some of the people that work in there told me years ago. So who knows? It could have happened. Cromwell was a Puritan, I believe, and so they thought they were very much against all statues and things in worship, so they went around bashing everything down and all this kind of stuff. Just like Henry VIII went round with the, the dissolution, dissolution of the Monasteries Act, so he smashed up all these great houses of prayer and monasteries all around the British Isles um, in his rage and in his tantrum against the Pope because the Pope wouldn't let Henry divorce his wife and marry another one and so he vented his displeasure by smashing up every catholic monastery and thing like that in the whole of britain um but you can hear somebody's playing the organ inside that place let's get a bit closer i can hear it but i don't know if you can Right underneath the chapel there, you can see. I can hear somebody playing the organ inside it, coming out through these thick stone walls. Um, amazing. Absolutely amazing. This, this Of its style, this is the largest chapel like this in the whole world. And as I pan up, you can pretty much see why, how big it is. But it really is quite massive. When you see a person stood next to this from a distance, they look really tiny. You know, you're coming up to sort of there, about two of the blocks up from this bit here, from that bit there, but two blocks up, you know, it's a rough average height of a man, maybe. So that's about six feet. Then if you go up, look. It really is quite massive. Amazing piece of architecture. Uh, a lot of things have happened over the years. Beautiful tree just here as well, actually. Look at this tree here. You see that tree? That's something you'll always find in Cambridge. These beautiful trees, mature trees, things like that. The leaves are drawn a lovely golden colour. Absolutely fantastic. In fact, I might go under there. And we can go under this beautiful tree and chat together have the college in the background, the chapel, we can go under this lovely tree with all the golden leaves around, and uh, in fact I'm going to go over here, and then right behind me, you'll see some building, okay, so, right behind me there, Bells are going off. Listen. Eight o'clock in the morning. That's what that is. Eight o'clock in the morning. And there behind me, that white, white building. 
And there's another one just here as well, another part of it there. You see that? Those are called those are called the Senate buildings, I think so. So if you get a degree from Cambridge University, if you get you know you become a an ordinary degree, or you get a master's degree, or you get a, a doctor's degree, or you become a professor. Those are the buildings you go in to receive your entrance into that degree. And what they used to do, you had to kneel before the masters of the college and put your hands together like this. And then they would put their hands on the outside of your hands. And to say that you're being inducted into that degree. Hmm. As I understand it, that type of thing actually dates back to the time of the Druids and where um, and, and lords and kings and things like that, people would put their hands, it's called the Oath of Fealty. And you would put your hands like that and then the, the master, the lord, would put his hands on your hands and he would promise to protect you and you would promise to be his loyal slave and servant type thing. Also, there was the thought that in... Um, Druidism and things like that in uh, Celtic practice, another thing that when the Druid or the Lord or the King did something like that, put their hands upon your hands on the outside while you're in submission, kneeling like this, that something passed from them into you and now you're their subject. Um, so I don't know what I think about Cambridge University doing this. I don't know. It's just some history I've looked at and it's an interesting uh, point, if nothing else. Whether they still do that today or not, I'm not really sure. Um, I could find out quite easily. I haven't looked into it that deeply, but it's still an interesting point of history to me, anyway. So, there we are. So, welcome to Cambridge. You can hear the bells chiming. So, either those other bells are slow or fast... <laughs> Because that's King's College that just made that dinging, and the others did it about two minutes before. So somebody's clock is not synced up, is it? The different old mechanical things. Um, so there we go. So anyway, so welcome to Cambridge. Welcome to this place. One of the reasons I, I showed you some of these things, I wanted to get a flavour for how how much history has gone on here in Cambridge, and how many incredible things have taken place in this city. Of course. Uh, young men and women come from all over the world to Cambridge to learn at the very prestigious colleges and then go on to be pretty much leaders all over the world in various fields. There's very much an international uh, student base here. Of course, you know, a bit more difficult at the moment with all of what's gone on with this stuff that's happened in the last year or two with the coronavirus situation. Um, but still, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about that. But um, very, very interesting place. Um, yeah, back in the day, there was a, a group called the Cambridge Seven, and they had a great revival uh, here in the Cambridge University, uh, one of which was C.T. Studd, the famous English cricketer. Another one was Hudson Taylor, who went on to found the China Inland Mission, I believe it was. So Hudson Taylor was here, C.T. Studd was here, uh, many other, they called them the Cambridge Seven, and they did tremendous things for God. Uh, and that type of thing. There's a lot of history. There's so much history. It's too much to try and uh, give you in one um, program. But um, I find it fascinating. The reason I'm telling you this, the reason I'm showing all of this, is to give you an understanding. This has been a very special place on the earth for scientific discovery, uh, for uh, the Reformation to break forth from here. You know, that type of thing that led on to all kinds of things within the church. Uh, so over the years, and many people over the years that have come here have been had great breakthroughs in science and in medicine, um, uh, in many things. The atom was split here in 1932. Uh, the electron discovered here, DNA discovered here, all in one place. It's fascinating. God has graced this place, I think, in, in, a, in a unique way, like Oxford and other places where these sort of clusters of this incredible revelation and knowledge has come, where there's been great movements throughout the church and different things. Uh, so there's a lot of history to the city of Cambridge. 
Um, I very much felt that when I moved here in uh, you know, years ago. I lived here previously in Cambridge, and I was going around all of these colleges praying in their chapels for the revival fire of God to break out in Cambridge University and touch these future leaders of world um, corporations, governments, banks, you know, things like that. This is where they come to. Places like Cambridge and Oxford, you know, other places like Harvard and Yale and all these other type of universities. This is where these people come to study and then go back to their country, their, their position. Their, you know, this is, and so the people that come, uh, some of them are, are going to be very influential in the world in years to come. And that's why prophetically it's important that we reach these people uh, and get opportunity to instill Jesus into young people. But when, if they go and end up being the leader of a country or a top scientist or a doctor or a military leader or something, that they've got the values of Jesus Christ in their heart and their spirit, and that helps the world in general. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's not just anywhere Cambridge is. not it's, it's got a very strategic importance to the kingdom of God. So the other day when we had uh, a prayer meeting, in that church at St. Edward King and Martyr, where Latimer preached from the pulpit, there was a real sense of the presence of God. I gave a word about the need for repentance and forgiveness, uh, and people uh, took that on board, uh, the different leaders represented in there. Uh, and so it was really interesting to see what God is doing now. It's only the first meeting I've been to there, actually. So it just encouraged to meet other Christian leaders uh, and hear what's going on with their groups. There's an outreach coming up soon that people are going to join together in from all different groups, which, again, is encouraging, isn't it? Yesterday here, there was a, at least two groups out that I knew of. Um, and that was there was a group from Calvary Chapel, Cambridge Church uh, in Cambridge, and also a mixed group of people doing worship as well from different churches in Cambridge. Um, and so there, and there's other people out there. So there's quite a lot of stuff beginning to emerge again and again on the streets, um, out and about. Things are happening. And I'm praying for a great move of the Holy Spirit here in Cambridge, England. I'm praying for the fire of God to erupt uh, and break forth. Like I said, I prayed for somebody yesterday who was supernaturally healed in the market square, just literally yards away from where I'm standing. Um, never seen this man before in my life, but had words of knowledge, a word of knowledge to him about arthritis, in, double arthritis in his shoulders. Prayed for him and he was instantaneously healed of arthritis here yesterday, Saturday. In the, and in the market square, the market was in full flow. Thousands and thousands of people milling past, people street performing, playing music, singing, um, Weird demonstrations from people like Extinction Rebellion were all dressed up like ghosts and walking around, the, walking around like this and doing all this stuff, you know, trying to be dramatic. Um, you know, there's all sorts going on. Cambridge is a very, very busy place uh, like that. And so I'm looking forward to uh, doing some more uh, outside work here in Cambridge and hopefully I'll be able to broadcast that. So you can see live when I'm praying for people to be healed or leading somebody to Jesus, if it's possible, or lead, doing worship in the street and seeing the power of God come upon the people in the street and they can hear and see and feel the anointing and the presence and the power of God. So you'll see it if that stuff, I'm able to get it done, you know, then you'll, I'll post up a video if at all possible. So the, or a live program and have the camera live. So you can watch live as it takes place, as we literally pray for somebody to be healed, as we literally lead somebody to Jesus and um, have, a, have a camera open on a live stream like this. So you can, just as if you were standing in the street uh, there and then as well, watch it all take place. So there you go. I hope you've enjoyed your little trip today around Cambridge City with me. Uh, my name's Christopher Cass and I live here in Cambridge. And uh, thank you for joining me. If you wish to write to me, you can see my email uh, scrolling across the screen down there at the bottom. You see in the blue banner just down there. And the email address of Chris C. Prophet at gmail dot com. So Chris C. Prophet at gmail dot com. You can write to me on that email address. I do suggest you try using the email messenger. Half the time for me it doesn't work. They're blocking me for no reason. So you could send me a message. I might not see it for a week. 
So do use the email address. That's a better way of, of getting through uh, to me, really, because Messenger does not always work, unfortunately. Sometimes when I send people, well, every every time, not some, every single time I send people messages that I'm going live, I get to so many people I send it to, that then I'm banned for the next, I don't know how long. Every time, that's, that's been happening to me for two or three years. So um, I, I can only send so many messages, then it just cuts off. Says, your message isn't sent. Your message isn't sent. Tap here for details. Oh, we've got to guard against spam. And I'm, I'm sending messages to my personal friends I'm connected to on Facebook. And that's not good, apparently. So there we go. That's the weirdness of Facebook. But there we go. Today, we're broadcasting on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter simultaneously. So don't forget to sign up for my uh, YouTube account, particularly, uh, which is still Christopher Cass. You can find me on uh, Twitter as well. Um, I think my actual Twitter, my Twitter handle, or whatever you call it, is Rev Fire Min One, Revival Fire Ministries One, I think. But I've still got Christopher Cass attached to it as well. So I'm not sure if I'm, uh, I'm on Twitter. My, it's my name again, Christopher Cass, or it's Rev Fire Min One. So you might have to do that to find me on Twitter. I don't know. I, I, if you're not sure, I can always post you a link if you contact me uh, or to my Twitter account. If you wanted to sign up for that and get notifications, if you wanted to sign up to my YouTube account again, if you can't find it, send me a message and I will send you a link so you can sign up. When you get there, sign up for notifications. Press the it looks like a bell. I think press the bell. I think twice you've got to do it. And then when I go on YouTube. Because that's also, I'm simultaneous with Facebook now. If you prefer to watch it on YouTube, you can. And, uh, you know, we've got no loyalty to Facebook, essentially. It's just a platform that works for us to be able to communicate. So um, every time I'm, I'm broadcasting, if it all works correctly, I'm on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter at the moment, every time. The other day I tried to do a program, I said I'm going live and then it, it wouldn't work. Facebook was down in England. And so that wouldn't work. Then Messenger wouldn't let me send another message to people to tell them that it wasn't that I couldn't come on because it wasn't working. You get the idea. And on and on it goes. Then Google went funny and said, is this you trying to sign in? Yes. You're at an unusual location. No, I'm not. And, and it was all, it took me well over an hour to try and get it. Then, and then Facebook was still down. So sign up for YouTube as well and or Twitter, whichever. And I'm looking into it this time as well. What other um, social media platforms or ways that we can do this thing so that we can keep in contact and keep broadcasting, even if Facebook bans me or just explodes or dies of death or whatever. We don't want to be able to lose our contact and the Christian community that we have together. We can pray for each other and all that sort of stuff. All the good things we've built together. You know, if, if I'm just on Facebook and they turn it off, it's done, isn't it? So. We're not having all our eggs in one basket. We're in, on YouTube and Twitter as well. And I'm looking into other ways of, of broadcasting, other platforms. Um, I have been offered to go on Apple TV, Google TV, Roku streaming service. Um, I don't know. There was multiple things there I could go on for a certain amount of money um, to, to access to all of those and broadcast all over the planet to those places um, as well. But again, it costs a fair bit of money, and I, 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 you know, I'm not, I can't commit that amount of money to broadcasting, even though I would probably reach millions of people, um, because there are millions in these big networks. But um, you know, you got to do with what you've got at the time. So I would need a lot more. Well, I would need some supporters, <laughs> a lot more. Well, more supporters financially. If I was to do something like that, people would have to regularly give and commit to it because I can't commit that amount of money to broadcasting, you know. So, but we'll see. Let's see what God does. I mean, if He wants me to go on the television and all these other things, and you know, uh, iOS app as well, and uh, Android app, um, Google TV, Roku TV, Amazon Fire TV. Uh, all that. I've got the opportunity to do that now. Um, so that would be interesting if I, I went on all of that, wouldn't it? Um, I wonder what would come of it. You know, I might, I might do it even if I did it for a month or two and just, yeah, cause it's quite expensive and see what it did. See if it was worth doing. If I had people contacting me and wanting to get in touch, wanting prayer ministry, wanting to give financially, I don't know. Who knows? Maybe it would snowball and it would be able to, um, 
sustain itself so I could go onto that uh, worldwide platform. But it, I've got that offered to me now already. So I could do that. Um, and there are other ways of doing it as well. The satellites and things I do know of that reach millions of people as well. But to go on most of those things, of course, you need money, you know, to do that. You need or favor. I mean, if you, if you get favor with the owner of the satellite company, you might say, oh, I like you, Chris. You can do it for free. Go on, just send me something. And I'll put you up there as because you bless me. God does things like that. He can give you favor. So let's see what happens with it. It would be interesting to see. I, I'm not interested in being famous or, or doing that for the sake of it. I just want the message of Jesus to reach as many people as possible and have the opportunity to pray for as many people as possible because the, the Lord has put a healing gift in my life and a prophetic gift and things like that. I want to try and help and bless people, a teaching and equipping thing. I want to try and help the body of Christ and equip them. You know, that's what the fivefold ministry is there to do, to equip the saints, Ephesians chapter 4, for the work of the ministry. And so the more people you can do that to at once, I suggest would probably be the better, wouldn't it, really? Um, but I also like the personal touch that we have on our Facebook, YouTube, Twitter programs where, you know, we know people and can greet them by name. But we may not be able to do that in the future so much um, if things grow bigger and bigger and bigger. It has been prophesied over me many times that I would be on TV and live there with each millions of people, but we'll see. It's not something I'm seeking at all. Lots of people, they want to, they want profile or fame until they get it. Like a lot of these movie stars, I can't go anywhere. People are following me with cameras and bothering me. That's the trouble with fame, if you're, or being in the public eye, if you put it that way. It swings and roundabouts, and you, know, you get there's some, some good things about it. There's some bad things about it. You can reach more people, finances can come, and um, fruit and progress can happen. But then you can have too much of that, and people, you know, wanting to get a picture of you through your bathroom window, and these weird the paparazzi and the negative stuff. Of press. So it's a different thing. Um, personally, I think it's better to be sort of uh, anonymous more really than it is to be famous. There's only one we want famous. His name's Jesus. That's who needs to be famous. So we're supposed to die to ourselves and let him shine through us, you know. Not the other, not us stand there and go, oh, hello. And we're all trying to get our face on the television, and you know, like people do sometimes, unfortunately. Now let me have a look. Who on earth have we got on here? I haven't really looked at all at all of this. Ah, uh, Steve-O. There's my friend, Mr. Mansfield. Look up there in London town. Good morning, Steve. And all oh, of Karina's there as well. Uh, get a website, she says. Good idea. Uh, pray for Chris for a divine opportunity. Yeah, why don't you do that? Yeah, that'd be nice. Um, what else we got Karina, Steve, David says, well, David Redding, look there, he's David. Hello, David. Good to see you too. Uh, oh, Ailey McLeod, Scotland, and Carolyn Gerald's there. Look, cool. Janet in Norway, there she is. Look, it looks like Cane to us in English, but uh, I, it's pronounced Janet. Janet. Sotoglu, uh, Sotoglu, I've probably completely annihilated her surname there. Uh, Marianne, no, Margaret Ann Loftus as well. New Zealand, Auckland, New Zealand, God bless you. There we are, I'm terribly out of frame, really. I should be back there and you can see me, and I should be in, in the third portion of the picture, about there, talking to you about, and it goes the other way, talking to you about Cambridge, you know, and you get the good view and you. You're not sort of in the middle here in the way like that. It's bad filming. You, you can be centre screen like news people. You can be uh, to one side, you know, and talking like this, you know. All the different things you can do to make it look better. More viewable to you, the viewer. If I'm up like this, well, the thing is, bleh! <laughs> it doesn't matter in a sense. We're not trying to be professional, but there's nothing wrong with it. Getting it looking a bit nicer. So if I do go on telly, I'll be, I, uh, you know, I'll be more accustomed to the camera and doing it correctly. And they have to keep saying, you need to move here. You need to give some director bugging you for every day. If you sort of go, yeah, and you do it naturally, and they think, well, oh, this guy's good. He's, he's easy to work with. Maybe we'll get him on again. Well, I won't be demanding all blue M&Ms in the green room either, like some of these people do. <laughs> they get tickets on themselves, eh? some of these famous people. They say, I want M&M's in my dressing room. They must be only blue. <laughs> what the heck? Well, I suppose it's their favourite thing. Gives them a comfort. A home from home sort of thing. I don't know. So how are things you're in today, wherever you are? Um, just, uh, I haven't had my coffee yet. 
It's still slightly warm. I bought this about five o'clock in the morning. It's now eight now. I went down to McDonald's in Whittlesford. And it's the only place open that time in the morning. I went to the Shell garage to get one from the Costa machine in the Shell garage, only to find he goes, she said, I'm really sorry, we haven't got any milk. Oh, great. So, <laughs> so 5 a.m. looking forward to my early morning coffee and there was no milk. There's no milk in Waitrose either. I said, I said, you haven't got any milk. What's going on? I haven't eaten for a week. And, the, you know, and this bloke goes, oh, we've got supply issues and driver issues. And I thought, oh, good grief. So, uh, I thought, well, they've still got to milk the cows every day. My uncle's family's had five dairy farms. You know, you, you have to milk cows every single day. So there's masses of milk. It's like, what's the problem? And don't tell me there's a shortage of milk. It's ridiculous, you know. But apparently there's a shortage of drivers to drive the tanker to the farm to fill up with all the milk from the bulk tank in the farm to then drive it off to wherever and uh, or to collect the bottles from the farm as they bottle them locally and then deliver them around. That was the beauty of having lots of small places around, like uh, my family farms. You know, my Uncle Terry had a farm, and they would had cows, had freezing cows on that. They would milk them on the farm. They would bottle the milk on the farm, and then they would deliver the milk themselves to the doorstep. So, you, you know, and had a round locally in the local towns and villages and would drop milk off and regular as clockwork for 100 years. But then all these supermarkets came round, you see, selling milk so cheap and people were buying it, even though it was rubbish, and they were selling it for less than it, what it cost to produce it to the farmers, and they put them all out of business. And then you used to, when you used to have local, fresh, good milk delivered to your doorstep, you didn't even have to go in there to get it. You just opened the front door, and there it would be ready for breakfast every day, fresh as a daisy, all gone. Because of the supermarkets and these great big things pushing out all the small businesses. That's why many small ones are better than one big one. Like many, many, you know, house churches might be better than one big church. Because then if one goes down, you've still got the rest. And you could always meet together once a month and have a big celebration. But you had more intimate stuff going on as well. It's, it's both really, isn't it? You go to a really big church, the trouble with that is you go in there and you might say, hello, how are you? It's about three people. And then that's your lot. You can't really and maybe meet somebody midweek. So they try and blend it that way, have a big thing and the midweek groups. I don't know. I'm just gabbling on, chatting here this morning, really. Um, you know, Steve says preach it. Look at that. And uh, the cows are isolated. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm not going down there, that road. I'm so bored of stuff to do with what, what, what uh, you know what, that I'm not even going there. Yeah. So, um, so there we are. So I hope you've enjoyed your view around. There's a bad bit of camera stuff. Look. Better. Divide your screen into thirds. Are you in the upper and middle or higher third? And are you in the right, the middle or the left third? Apparently. That's what they say in landscape photography. I went looked at, looked at that recently. I thought, well, I'm doing all this anyway. I'm just looking at it. What looks good? I take a picture of it. Cool. So... It was refreshing to know that I was doing most of it already. A couple of things I learned and thought, well, it might help make it look a bit better. But I was kind of doing it anyway, but um, without knowing it. So, so there we are. I should, I'm going off to church this morning, actually, in a while. So um, I've got to go home soon. Because Bridget will be wondering where I am. Um, we're going to Calvary. Cambridge, Calvary Chapel, Cambridge this morning. Pastor James Pete there. So I knew the founding pastor of that, Joey Rosek, actually. I used to do evangelism with him in Cambridge. I only did previously, met him in the street when I was doing evangelism with a, with a friend of mine called Wiley Smiley, believe it or not. Big guy, Wiley is, black guy, huge guy. And me and him used to go around doing games and uh, praying for the sick, getting words of knowledge and stuff. And then we met Joey as well. And he used to come around and he's a great Bible teacher. Calvary Chapel used to work at Costa Mesa, Calvary Chapel in California, you know, 30,000 seat mega church, uh, Chuck Smith. So we, and we teamed up, Wiley, Joey, and myself, and we had some good adventures in Cambridge years ago. And uh, up, Joey's moved back to America and planted a new church in the United States in New Jersey area, I think. So he's over there now. Uh, but Wiley is still around. So I meet up with Wiley. And, um, you know, so we do things when we get the opportunity. So. But off to church this morning, 
uh, Calvary Chapel, Cambridge. I was actually out where Calvary Chapel were yesterday by the guilt hall, and that's where I prayed for this man who got instantaneously healed of arthritis yesterday morning in the Market Square. I had a word of knowledge for him. Use the gifts, friends. I mean, he um, he was a Christian, and it was an incredible divine appointment, actually, yesterday. If you knew the whole of it, uh, it turns out he'd lived in Scarborough, as like I'd lived in Scarborough. I mean, you all knew places in Scarborough. And he'd lived on the Isle of Wight, where I used to live. And I knew everywhere he was talking about. Then he told me, oh, I went to this place where these nice Christian people were. And it was a place that I used to help work at as well, called Aspire in Ride. And I said, you know the guy that leads the cafe, A.D.? He says, yeah, I know A.D. I said, yeah, I led him to Jesus, his old mate of mine. This bloke couldn't believe it. He was from Yorkshire, but in Cambridge yesterday, sat next to him, pop on these two benches. Somebody was playing some music, so I cracked open the conversation. I said, cool, that music's pretty good, isn't it? And he said, yeah, it is. We got into a conversation, found that we'd both been in Scarborough. We'd both been in the Isle of Wight, lots of things in common. Turns out he was a Christian. So then I talked to him a bit further. I looked at him and God showed me. Um, so that's what he does. I look at people and God shows me things because I'm a seer, S-E-E-R. I can see things like in your body and stuff like that. And so I said, you've got arthritis, haven't you? He said, yes. I said, both shoulders. He said, yes. I said, he goes, how do you know that? I said, God just told me. I said, hey, let's pray for you. I laid hands by and prayed for him. I said, right, there you go. I said, move your shoulders. He goes, oh, he goes, it's gone instantaneously healed in the street yesterday in the market square thousands of people filing past just in front of me was pastor james with the church there they were handing out tracts and, and ministering and evangelizing people there a bit further on up the road bridget was in the park with a load of people and doing worship and they were singing and, uh, and all, that, all of that was going on yesterday as well so there's a lot going on in cambridge and, and i believe there's a lot more to follow so do keep watching what God does here. I'll post things as much as possible and, you know, let you know if there's anything of interest around. I really want to encourage you to use those spiritual gifts when you're talking to people about Jesus, because it really cracks open the door. And, um, and, if, and if the public are there and they witness you do it as well, by extension of them just watching, they get witnessed too without even you having to talk to them. So, I mean, I, let, let, I was there. I said, well, I'm going to pray for you. And there was people all sat, there was people sat next to us on other benches. I said, I'm going to pray for you right now. I laid the house in the name of Jesus, Lord, touch him, heal him of this arthritis. Go right now of his body. I, I spoke at that volume. And there's people around thinking, what's that? What's he shouting about? And they see me with my hands on him. I said, now move his shoulders. And he, moved, he goes, it's gone. I said, you're healed. Jesus Christ has just healed you. There's people all around, all listening and hearing and seeing that take place. So you can evangelize without evangelizing directly because they see what you do. Do you see what I mean? So there's ways and ways of doing things. And I'd encourage you to use those spiritual gifts to get out there, uh, to tell people about Jesus. Get out there with love in your heart. Get out there full of the scriptures. Get out there with conversational joy and get there and meet people. And God himself will come through and do things. And the more and more you'll see miracles, signs and wonders breaking forth. You're never going to see them sat on the couch at home doing nothing, are you? Reinhard Bonker said, you know, he said, God doesn't anoint people to sit on the couch. He anoints movers, movers, people that move, people that do it. I'll show you my faith by my action, it says in the book of James. You've got to start with doing some action and then you see the miracle come. Then you see the breakthrough. When you step out of the boat and your weight is gone, then you walk on the water, but not before. It wasn't dip a toe in, out, in, out. At one point, Peter had to say, OK, Lord, I'm coming out of the boat. And he, and his weight went, and there he was, to his amazement. Then he eventually doubted and he went under, and Jesus rescued him. But he did it, though, didn't he? Peter got out of that boat and walked on that water. What a man. What a fella. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I, I think he's awesome to do that, Peter. Oh, absolutely. So, so um, impressed that Peter, because he didn't have the benefit of reading, you know, the New Testament and seeing an, an example and going, oh, people can walk on water because I've read it in here. He was doing it there and then. There'd been no example apart from Jesus stood in front of him. And Peter was like, well, here we go, lads. <laughs> he went. What a fella. I want to shake his hand and say, Pete, 
you're fantastic. That was really cool what you did there. You know, so, uh, yeah. Um, oh, did, have I missed something here? Da, 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 da. Somebody said something. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah. Well, I can hear the organ playing there in King's College Chapel. Incredibly atmospheric. They do Christmas carols in there at Christmas, the King's College Chapel Choir. It's world famous. It's televised. It goes on TV. And that's in there, right behind me there. In that huge building right there, you can probably see it. See the, by the tree here. I love this tree. Golden leaves. We are great. just fantastic. Right in the heart of Cambridge. Fantastic. I'm so blessed to live here. God's nice to me, isn't he? He obviously likes Christopher. Oh, look, I'm inside a little thing there, look. I'm framed by the tree. Pretty arty. There's so much beauty around here. It's a job to know where to go, really. Nice little um, yellow leaves there, sort of, you know, casually there. And here I am in Cambridge, you know, emanating beauty and luxury. <laughs> Cambridge, uh, England's premier city. Uh, you do come along. Do come and visit Cambridge. Go punting on the river in a little boat with a long stick. You go along like that, long pole. Very nice. Come to the colleges and university, King's College. Come. Oh, you go. <laughs> mm. Ah, a bit of coffee, even if it's tepid. It's still, um,. Tepid's better than cold, isn't it? I spent so long gabbling. <laughs> oh, he's gone cold even in a thermal car. <laughs> oh, dear. Serena, tally ho. I like that. Yeah, here we are. Let's put that on the screen. I like that one. Tally ho! That's sort of thing they shouted when they were fox hunting, wasn't it, on a horse? Tell you who. i got a funny story about that. I went down the golf club once with my dad when he was alive and his brother, my uncle Colin, and it was all over down the golf club, you know, and all the rest of it. I'd not played golf before on a proper golf course. I'd done pitch and putt, and I was quite good with, like, tennis rackets, cricket bats, and all this stuff, so I could hit the ball all right. Now, I don't know why. This is a true story. I don't know why. But I had a strange experience on the golf course. I went there and I thought about it before I went because Dad said, we're going to go and play on this certain day, right? So what I did, I went and bought myself a bright green, luminous green golf ball, right? So I thought, well, if I get this bright green ball, right, it goes in the dark nearly, right? I thought, I can't lose that. And if it, if my ball gets mixed up, we'll know which one's mine from anybody else's, right? So I got this bright green, luminous golf ball, pride of joy, so I polished it off, put it on the tee, right? And I got ready with the golf club like this, you know, and I'll crack. I hit this, hit this ball. It goes about three inches off the ground at about 100 mile an hour. Like this. It's like a right grass cutter. And it went off and it was lost. I couldn't find it. It was luminous. I still couldn't find it, right? So that was my start of the golf thing. So anyway, so they give me another ball, right? So we couldn't find it. So I get up there and I hit this ball. And actually, I did all right the second time. And uh, I did really well, actually, on the round, round playing golf. I kept up with my dad and my uncle, much to their annoyance, because they actually play at the golf club. My dad was club champion as well, senior champion, all this stuff. <laughs> and I was, I was keeping up with them. I said, I might take up this golf. It's pretty easy, really, isn't it? Like this, and they're like, like <laughs> points them up, because they're all serious about you know, doing it right. And I went, well, I've got one, I I've messed up the first one, but after that, I didn't. I, I, I got it going, and I was actually doing pretty good. But what happened, the funny thing was, is this is what prompted the story. Is Karina talks about tally-ho, these people do. They have a hunting horn, and they go, <laughs> and they go, tally-ho, and off they go, chasing the fox, or whatever, as far as I gather. Well, I thought that when... <laughs> it's true. I thought that when you hit a really good shot in golf, you shouted, because I'd seen people doing that, and I thought they were doing like tally ho. That's what I didn't know. I genuinely thought that if you did a good shot, you shouted out four. I think you know, and you wear your funny trousers at golf, your plus fours. And I thought it's just part of the gig. You know what I mean? So anyway, I hit this ball and I went 
Fuck! Like, it's like they hit a girl, and all these people ducking and doing this, right? Because what you do is you shout for when you hit a ball, and the ball is going to strike another person. And you put your arm out like that to say where it's coming from. You go, four, like that, as a way of trying to warn someone about to hit on the head with a golf ball. So I'm not a silent. I went, ah! It's a gusto. Like, these people were hitting the deck. And my, my dad and my uncle said, what are you doing? I said, well, that's what you're doing, it. When you hit a good one, you shout, four. Then, yeah, I thought this was all part of the wearing the funny trousers golfing experience, you know. Four! I tell you, I'm getting into character. I'm... You know, playing the game. I'm getting into part with being a golfer. They said, no, you idiot. <laughs> they never took me around golf ever again after that. I was so embarrassed because it was right near the clubhouse. And all the people from the clubhouse were watching. All these people were hitting the floor. And, and I said, oh, it's Tony's son. And Colin's nephew. Look, look what he's doing. And they're, they're all embarrassed of me. I'm humiliating them in front of the golf course, not knowing. <laughs> so I never got invited again. Well, I was a bit mean, really, because I, I, I didn't do it afterwards. I, after I'd been told about it, I didn't do it. I didn't know. I mean, it's like not the end of the world, is it? But they're like, oh, you embarrassed us from golf club. <laughs> so anyway, what was funny, actually, was when my mother's funeral took place and uh, got David Redding on the phone. David was at my mother's funeral. And he can tell you how powerful my mother's funeral was. At the end, everybody stood up and cheered and clapped at my mother's funeral after I took the funeral. But anyway, at the wake, down at the golf club afterwards, because it was at the golf club, um, some of these uh, friends of my dad and other people, uh, these uh, you know seasoned golfers, and some of them were interesting characters, shall I put it that way. <laughs> One of them, big, tough character. Right, I, I could tell you some stories about him. I'm not going to say too much on air, but uh, a, a strong, tough man, used to fighting and all sorts of stuff like right? this. Right, I'll, I'll leave it there. Right, <laughs> he comes up to me afterwards because I, I got a drink and I was just standing outside getting some fresh air for a minute out the back of the door of the, of the wake room because there were some people out there and I knew some of them. And because I took the funeral and I was the one at the end shaking everybody's hand, they all knew who I. I got a suit on and all this sort of stuff. And so I'm out there greeting, and it was my mother, of course, and I'm greeting some of the people and talking to them at the golf club and that. Anyway, I go outside, and then one of my uh, friends, and my dad's friend, but only my dad, but I a friend of mine as well, he comes up to me and he goes, F in L, Chris. No, I'm not going to say the word, but you know the word, F U C K I N G. He went, F in L, Chris, F in L. He's going like that. I said, What's up? No, I need news is now. I said, What's up, mate? He goes, yeah, been hell. He goes, that blooming Bible, that's powerful, isn't it? I said, it is, isn't it? He goes, he goes, when you were reading out that stuff and saying the things you were saying, he goes, he goes, every now and then, he goes, I could hardly hold myself together. He goes, it's wrecking me. It's doing me in. He says, so powerful, that Bible. I said, it is. I said, you might want to get to know God more. I said, you know me, I'm one of the lads. I'm down to earth. I was there. We were, we were. I was there fighting and drinking like all the rest of them. But I've met something and found it real. And he goes, he goes, oh, you're not kidding there. He's like, effing hell, he goes. Like this. <laughs> and there was another bloke going, yeah, effing was, wasn't it? He goes, effing hell, effing hell. And they're all in the golf club saying this around the back, having a cigarette, a cigar and that. And so <laughs> it, it was, um, like, of course, Karina saying Tally Ho reminded me of that situation that's led into all of that awful. So <laughs> it's a funny story, though, isn't it, really? That was down at Cow's Golf Club on the Isle of Wight. Cow's Golf Club. My dad was club captain down there at one point, Tony Cass. And he, he was um, seniors champion and all the rest. He's very good at sport, my dad. So he, he took up golf when he was about my age, about 55, actually. Because he hadn't done sport for years and he used to love sport. I said, take up golf. I said, you'll win at that as well. Because he was, my dad was like super sportsman, you see. He was Southern England boxing champion. And he got to the semi-finals for the England title itself. He, so he played, he boxed for the Isle of Wight at county level. He played football for the Isle of Wight at county level. And he played cricket for the Isle of Wight at county level. All three sports. Uh, then in, the, in his day, uh, he got called up for national service. And so they called him up and he ended up eventually getting posted to Berlin, Germany, uh, doing his national service, not that far after the Second World War. So he went there and he was uh, he went in Hitler's bunker and um, 
he, he went to a Spandau prison where Rudolf Hess was a prisoner, the Nazi Rudolf Hess. And in fact, he had a, my dad had a chessboard that was made in Spandau prison. We had that for years and years and years and some water or something got on it once and ruined it and had to get thrown out. But, um, it, it, it got left in a garage and got wet and all that kind of, probably wouldn't have worth a lot of money, but, um, as a piece of memorabilia, if you like, but, um, Anyway, so he was so good at all those sports that when he joined the army in national service, they actually made him a physical training instructor in the army. And then uh, as a result of that and him being so good at football, cricket and boxing, that he ended up representing the British army for football, cricket and boxing. All three sports. And he was the only person at the time, I believe, in history that had represented the British army at three separate sports at, you know, a force level, not just a, a local unit or a division or something like that, but actually for the army. So if, if the army were going to play football against the Navy, my dad would play. Do you understand? Or if they were going to box against, he would be one of the boxers. Or if he was going to um, play cricket, he would play cricket for the army. And so he spent all his time running around playing football, cricket, boxing in national service. And, uh, and of course the, um, the local uh, senior commander, the officer of where he was, he liked my dad because he was so good at cricket. They're sort of helping them to win games. And so he, he would he'd get a bit of a favour. But if you're doing well and the officers, you know, his men win a match, he's very happy indeed. You know, so my dad was popular uh, with the officer because they were winning things. And he said, well done, well done, Cassie goes, good effort. Private, or it's corporal then. When you come a physical training, training instructor, you automatically get stripes, you see. Um, anyway, I won't talk about that too much. My dad lost his stripes at one point, but he got them back again. And then some mates got caught drunk and they got, you know, they got their stripes ripped off their arms or something like that. Or, I don't know, something happened while they were out one night drinking in Germany, in Berlin, back in the day. So I don't want to tell you what for, really, but I'm not proud of my dad, what he used to, what he did and his accomplishments. And he was only a, a small in stature person, but my goodness me, was he fast. A fast runner and his timing with, um, you know, with a cricket bat, a tennis racket, a golf club was impeccable. Um, he was very strong for his size as well and fast. He was quite unique, really. And, uh, I used to do boxing with him and, uh, it's unbelievable. He was so fast. <laughs> and, uh, they used to, he, when he took up boxing, they actually called him the new Jimmy Wilde, which was a famous boxer and the man with a hammer in his hand. That was Jimmy Wilde's sort of nickname tagline, you know. So my dad, you know, he's known never over 300 fights. And so he was a pretty good boxer. And so he trained me in boxing, you know. So we, we, we used to spar and fight together, me and my dad, you know. And uh, he was so fast. And he was, of course, he was a Southern England champion. He went for the England title. I wasn't trained to his level, do you know what I mean? So I did my best, but he was, he was all over the place like this. So I thought, well... I'm going to do something about this because I can't beat him at boxing because he's too well trained and all that. You're going to get some England champion title, do you? You're being rubbish. So, um, so I thought, I know. So I took up martial arts. I took up karate and, uh, so I did karate and I did judo and I did a thing called MFS, modern fighting system, um, along with the boxing thing as well and that. So. When my dad started doing his stuff with me again, I then started changing tactics. And I said, I'm not fighting you Queensbury rules anymore, mate. It's over. I said, if you want to fight me, I'm going to fight you my way. Like this. I'd say he was doing all this. He's getting with his thing. But my legs are longer than his arms. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so he came out like that. And I'm like, I took his feet out underneath him with, a, with a, a sweep. I took him down or I got him in a grip and I threw him. You know what I mean? Got him past his punches, you know. So, uh, he got a bit frustrated with that one. He goes, that's not, that's not fair. That's not fair. You're Southern England boxing champion, but I'm not going to fight you, is it? I said, so uh, there's no rules in fighting, Dad. I said, you built your own Frankenstein here. <laughs> you trained me, you nutter. So don't blame me if I can beat you now. <laughs> and he was getting, he's older than me then. I was bigger and stronger than him as well. And so I had that advantage of having more strength and uh, speed and, and youth on my side. And, Mixing it with martial arts and kicking and jumping and throwing and stuff, not just boxing, you know, where well, he's epically good at it. So uh, I don't want to tell you all that for, but it's just interesting stuff, you know, I don't know, chatting, live things. 
We don't always have to have a 10 point sermon every time we come together. We can just have a bit of a chat like we were if you were sat down the pub and the eagle around the corner talking about the fact I've just discovered DNA. Really? Oh, OK. What did you do last week? I just discovered, the, I just split the atom. Really? Oh, that's exciting, isn't it? We're literally doing this around the corner here. <laughs> yeah, yes, I just discovered the electron. What's an electron? <laughs> oh, it's a thing. I've just called it that. It's new. <laughs> the people discover things and they're still going to eat lunch and have a pint and talk to their friends. But yet some people don't understand, do they? I think it was, I think it's just down the end of this road. Yeah, well, down that street there, Trinity Street, there is St. John's College. And in the front of St. John's College, there's a tree. And I think it's called the Isaac Newton tree. I don't know if it's the one or it's a cutting off of the tree that the apple fell off when Newton discovered gravity. It's things like that are just along the road here. It's just it's like, really? Yeah, for real. It's there. It's like, oh, wow. That's really, 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 really interesting, isn't it? So there we are. I got stripes, but it was for physical punishment. Do you know what, Steve? That doesn't surprise me in the least. Because after all, you are a bit of a cheeky monkey, aren't you? And I can imagine. <laughs> Mansfield! <laughs> yes. <laughs> Was that at school? Or somewhere else? I don't, I don't want to know that. But where did you get your... um? When did you... Was, or was it at home? Were you getting disciplined at home, Steve? Who gave you the thrashing? Just out of interest. <laughs> I don't know if he can um, tell me that on camera. As long as it doesn't incriminate somebody else. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but back in the day when Steve and I went to school, they still had the cane. And they would give you the cane, you know. <laughs> across the backside if you're naughty these days the kids are hitting the teachers <laughs> not the other way around <laughs> it's like what oh hey, you're not allowed to say or do anything that could offend everybody it's like oh my goodness sake how do you have any discipline how can you how can you run thousands of people if you can't install proper discipline into them and that's mental isn't it? it's like saying to the army you can't give me orders i'm offended that's my personal choice i want to do this well, if you do that, you might get shot through the head, you idiot, because you don't know what you're doing. But, you know, there are certain times and places where we need authority, don't we? We need rules and we need people in charge and we need to obey things, you know. It's like you can say, I want to do what I like. Nobody can tell me what to do. And then you walk across a motorway and get run over by a 16 wheel truck and splatted like a and you end up looking like a pot of strawberry jam. Uh, because you don't want to be told you're not allowed to walk on the motorway because cars are going 70 miles an hour up the motorway. Some things are for your own good, aren't they? Some things are like, stop being a numpty and pack it in. Is it, <laughs> you could hurt yourself, you could die, you're going to get arrested, it's going to hurt, kill you, it's going to hurt your health. Oh, hello. It's like some things that God says, don't do this, because for that reason. Why? Because it's going to hurt you, you numpty. Because it's going to cause you to have problems. It's going to alienate you from me, your biggest protection and help. Don't do it. I'm trying to help you here. I'm tipping you to the wise. But I want to do what I want to do. I can do what I like. You can, and you can live with the consequences as well. Think about that. You know, of course, it's your free choice to, you know, do what you like. You can jump off a building and say, I believe I can fly. But if you can't fly, you're going to have a bit of a quick end. You know, it's up to you, really. Nobody can make you do things in a sense. I mean, bar torture and things, they might be able to make you do it then. But you know what I'm saying? But if we wised up and stopped arguing and fighting with God and things like that and do what he asks, the world would be a lot better place for everybody. But man wants to do what man wants to do. And he said, well, I, I, I want to do what I want to do. Yeah, I'm sure you do. I'm going to have to go because I'm realising... Oh, I needed that. I'm parked somewhere, and nine o'clock is the cut-off time. And trust me, these guys, these traffic wardens around here, they take no prisoners, and they try and go out on Sunday mornings bagging people on purpose. So I've got to go right now, because I've got 11 minutes to walk back to where I started. Otherwise, they're going to be round. They run, go around on a bicycle going really quick. 
ticketing people on a Sunday. So I've got to go. Great to speak to you guys. Hope you're doing well. If you've got a prayer request, put it in the comments section and I will pray for it after the program is finished. Um, God bless you. Go to church if you can. Enjoy it. If it's a load of rubbish and they're all weird, don't go to church there. Go somewhere else. But go somewhere where you feel preached and feel love that Jesus is there. The Bible is preached. The presence of God is there. If those things are absent. Don't bother going. Find something different. God bless you. I'm going really fast today. Good to see you. And I'll catch up with you again soon. Bye bye.